Hey friends, I'm ready to do chapter nine, shooting match. Are you ready? Here we go. Omri put the cowboy and horse in his sock drawer while he had the quickest supper on record. Then he raced upstairs again, stopping only to pinch a few grains of Gillen's rat feed for the two horses. Shut up in his room, he took stock. A room this size was like a sort of indoor national park to the cowboy and the Indian. Should be easy enough to keep them apart for one night. Omri thought first of putting the new pair straight back into the cupboard and then bringing them back to life next morning in time for school. But he had promised Patrick not to. So he decided to empty out the dressing up crate and put the cowboy and his horse in there for the night. The crate was about two feet square, made of planks. There was certainly no visible way out of it for the cowboy. Omri put him in carefully. Looking down at him, he felt curious about his name, where he came from, and so on. But he decided it was better not to talk to him. The cowboy had clearly decided that Omri was not really there at all. When his big hands reached down, carrying some cold stew, grain for the horse, some fragments of apple for them both, and later, some cotton wool and scraps of material for bedding, the cowboy deliberately covered his eyes by pulling down his big hat brim. It was only when Omri reached in one final time to give him a drink of water in a minute green glass bottle that he had found in the bathroom cupboard that the cowboy spoke a word. Take that filthy stuff out of here, he suddenly shouted in his strong Texas accent. I ain't aiming to drink no more all oh, that long as I live and he heaved the bottle, which was almost as big as himself, up by its base and tipped its contents out onto the boards at the bottom of the crate. It's only water, Omri ventured to say. You shut your mouth, shouted the little man. I won't take no lip from no gold horn hallucination, no sir. Maybe I ought to drink too much. Maybe I can't hold in liquor. I'm some old them real tough guys do, but if an, I'm getting the delirium trimmings and, and starting in to see things, why couldn't I see pink and elephants and dancing rats and all them purdy things other fellas see when they gets far gone? It ain't fair for me to see giants and blue deserts and get put in a box the size of the Grand Canyon with no one but my little hoss for company. He sat down on the pile of hay, took the horse's nose in his arms, put his face against it, and began to sob. Omri was shattered. A cowboy crying? He didn't know what to do. When his mother cried, as she did sometimes when things got to be too much, she only asked to be left alone till she felt better. Maybe all grown-ups were like that. Omri turned away and got slowly into his pajamas, and then went to see how Little Bear was getting along on the far side of the crate. He finished the painting. The teepee looked really good. Little Bear was now in the longhouse arranging his blanket for the night. The pony was tethered to his post on a long rope. Omri took out the rat food and gave it to him, and then he called Little Bear out. Are you okay? Is there anything you need? He should have known better than to ask. Plenty. Want fire, longhouse. Keep warm. Keep animals away. Want tomahawk. So you can chop bits out of my leg? Little Bear angry when you say that. Sorry now. Use tomahawk. Cut down trees. Chop firewood. Kill fish. What fish? Little Bear replied with a good imitation of a fish swimming. And then he did a mime of catching it, putting it onto a block, and with a whirl of his arm, chopping off its head with a gleeful relish. Oh, I don't know about that, said Omri. You get tomorrow. Fish from plastic. Good tools. But fire. Now. Chief Little Bear say. Omri sighed. He went to the waste paper basket and picked out the remains of the other file that he had thrown away. In there, there was quite a lot of the fire lighter left. He gathered up some of the bits of willow bark and twigs from where Little Bear had been working. <sighs> You're not going to have it inside, though. That's far too dangerous. He arranged the fire on the part, the packed earth of the seed tray, about six inches from the entrance to the longhouse, first moving the teepee to safety. Then he struck a match, and soon 
there was a cozy blaze. Little Bear crouched beside it, his red skin glowing and his eyes bright with pleasure. Little Bear, can you dance? Yes, many kinds. Would you do one now so I can see? He hesitated, then he shook his head once. Why not, though? No reason, dance. Maybe if I got you a wife? The Indian looked up eagerly. You get? Give word? I only said I'll try. Then Lil Bear dance. Then do best dance. Love dance. Omri turned off his light and drew back from the scene. It looked amazingly real with the fire making shadows, the little horse munching his grain, and the Indian sitting on his heels warming himself, wearing his colorful headdress and chief's cloak. Omri wished he himself were small enough to join Little Bear by the fire. Omri, are you in bed? I'm coming up in five minutes to kiss you goodnight. Omri felt panicky, but it was all right. The fire was going out. Already Little Bear was standing up yawning and stretching. He peered up through the darkness. Hey, Omri, painting's good? Great. You go sleep now. Yes. Peace of great spirits be with you. Oh, thanks, and the same to you. Omri peered quickly into the crate. The poor cowboy had crawled away into his makeshift bed and was snoring loudly. He hadn't eaten a thing. Omri sighed. He hoped Patrick was making plans and arrangements. After all, if Omri could keep his Indian a secret, Patrick might be able to do the same. All might yet be well, but Omri certainly was not going to try the experiment again. It was all just too much worry. He climbed into bed, feeling unusually tired. His mother came in and kissed him, and the door was shut. He felt himself drifting off almost right away, when suddenly a piercing whinny sounded and was answered by another. The horses had smelled each other. They were not so far apart, and the cowboys wasn't tied up. Omri could hear his little hooves clattering on the bare boards of the crate, and then the whinnies began again, high, shrill, almost questioning. Omri thought of putting on his light, but he was awfully tired. Besides, what could he do? They couldn't possibly reach each other through the planks of the crate wall. Let them whinny their heads off. They'd soon get fed up. Omri rolled over and fell asleep. He was awakened just after dawn by shots. He was out of bed in about one-fifth of a second. One glance into that crate showed him all too clearly that that cowboy and his horse had escaped. The second glance showed how a knot in the wood had been pushed out or perhaps kicked out by the horse, leaving an oval shaped hole like an arched doorway, just big enough to let a horse and a rider through. Omri looked around wildly. At first he could see nothing. He dropped to his knees beside the seed box and peered into the longhouse. Little Bear was not there, nor was his horse. <laughs> Suddenly, some tiny thing whizzed past Omri's ear and struck the crate beside him with a ping. Twisting his head, Omri saw it, a feathered arrow the size of a pin, still, still quivering from its flight. Was Little Bear shooting at him? Little Bear, where are you? No answer, but suddenly a movement like that of a mouse caught the corner of his eye. It was the cowboy dragging his horse behind him. He was running half bent over from behind one chair leg to another. He had his revolver in his hand and his hat on his head. Another arrow flew, missing the crate this time and burying itself in the carpet just ahead of the running cowboy who stopped dead, jumped backward till his horse hit him and then fired another two shots from behind the horse's shoulder. Omri, following his aim, spotted Little Bear at once. He and his horse were behind a small heap of clo cloth, which was like a snow-covered hill to them, but was actually Omri's vest, dropped carelessly on the floor the night before. Little Bear, safe in the shelter of his cotton mountain, was just preparing to shoot another arrow at the cowboy, one that could hardly fail to hit its mark. The poor fellow was now scrambling desperately onto his horse to try to ride away, and was in full sight of that Indian as he drew back his bowstring. Little Bear, stop! Omri's frenzied voice rang out. Little Bear did not stop, but his surprise spoiled his aim and the arrow sped over the cowboy, doing no worse than sweep away his big hat and pin it to the baseboard behind the chair. 
This infuriated the little man, who, forgetting his fear, stood up in his stirrups and shouted, Tar nation, take ya, ya red varmint! Wait till I catch ya! I'll I have your stinking red hide for a sleeping bag! With that, he rode straight toward the vest hill at full gallop, shouting out strange cowboy war cries and waving his gun, which, by Omri's count, still had two bullets in it. Little Bear had not expected this, but he was only outfaced for a moment. Then he coolly drew up another arrow from his quiver and fitted it to his bow. Little Bear, if you shoot, I'll pick you up and squeeze you, Omri cried. Little Bear kept his arrow pointing toward the oncoming horseman. What you do if he shoot? He asked. He won't shoot? Look at him. Sure enough, the carpet was too soft for much galloping, and even as Omri spoke, the cowboy's horse stumbled and fell, pitching its rider over its head. Little Bear lowered his bow and laughed. Then, to Omri's horror, he laid down the bow among the folds of the vest, reaching for his knife, and began to advance on the prostrate cowboy. Little Bear, you are not touching him. Do you hear me? Little Bear stopped. He tried to shoot Little Bear. White enemy. Try take Indian's land. Why not kill? Better dead. I act quick. He not feel. You see. And he began to move forward again. When he was nearly up to the cowboy, Omri swooped up on him. He didn't squeeze him, of course, but he did lift him high and fast enough to give him a fright. Listen to me now. That cowboy is not after your land. He's got nothing to do with you. He's Patrick's cowboy, like you're my Indian. I'm taking him to school with me today so you won't be bothered by him anymore. Now you take your horse and get back to your longhouse and leave him to me. Little Bear, sitting cross-legged in the palm of his hand, gave him a sly look. You take him to school? Place you learn about ancestors? That's what I said. He folded his arms, offended. Why you not take Little Bear? Omri was startled into silence. If white fool with coward's face good enough, Indian chief good enough. You wouldn't enjoy it. If he enjoy, I enjoy. I'm not taking you. It's too risky. Risky? Fire water? Not whiskey risky, dangerous. He shouldn't have said that because Little Bear's eyes lit up. Like danger, here too quiet, no hunting, him only enemy, he said scornfully, peering over the edge of Omri's hand at the cowboy, who, despite the softness of his landing place, was only just scrambling to his feet. Look, he no use for fight. Little Bear soon kill. Take scalp, finish. Very good scalp. He added generously, fine color, look good on my belt. Omri looked across at the cowboy. He was leaning his ginger head against his saddle. It looked as if he might be crying again. Omri felt very sorry for him. You're not going to hurt him, he said to the Indian, because I won't let you. If he's such a coward, it wouldn't do your honor any good anyway. Little Bear's face fell and then grew mulish. No tell from scalp on belt if belong to coward or brave man, he said slyly. Let me kill and I do dance around campfire, he coaxed. No, Omri began. Then he changed his tactics. All right, you kill him, but then I won't bring you a wife. The Indian looked at him a long time. Then he slowly put his knife away. No touch. Give word. Now you give word. Take Little Bear to school. Take to plastic. Let Little Bear choose own woman. Omri considered. He could keep Little Bear in his pocket all day. No need to take any chances. If he were tempted to show the other children, well, he must resist temptation. That was all. And after school, he could take him to Yaps. The boxes with the plastic figures in them were in a corner behind a high stand. Provided there weren't too many other kids in the shop, he might be able to give Little Bear a quick look at the lady Indians before he actually bought one, which would be a very good thing. Otherwise, he might pick an old ugly one or, without even realizing it. It was too hard to see from their pl tiny plastic faces what they would really look like when they came to life. Okay, I'll take you, but you must do as I tell you and not make any noise. He put him down on the seat tray and gently shooed the horse up the ramp. Little Bear tied it to its post and Omri gave it some more rat food. And then he crawled on his hands and knees over to where the cowboy was now sitting dolefully on the carpet. His horse's rein looped around his arm, looking too miserable to move. What's the matter? asked Omri. The little man did not look up. Lost my hat, he mumbled. Oh, was that all? Omri reached over to the baseboard and pulled the pin-like arrow out of the wide brim of the hat. Here it is, he said kindly, laying it in the cowboy's lap. The cowboy looked at it, looked up at Omri, and then stood up and put on the hat. You sure ain't no regular hallucination, he said. I'm obliged to you. Suddenly he laughed. 
Just imagine thinking a piece of your delirium tremens for giving you your hat back. I just can't figure out what's going on around here. Say, are you real or was the engine real? Because in case you ain't noticed, you're a dang sight bigger he is than he is. You can't both be real. I don't think you ought to worry about that. What's your name? The cowboy seemed embarrassed and hung his head. My name's Boone, but the fellas call me Boo-Hoo. That's on account I'll cry so easily. It's my soft heart. Show me some something sad or scare me just a little and tears just come to my eyes. I can't help it. Omri, who had been somewhat of a crybaby himself until very recently, was not inclined to be scornful about this and said, That's okay. Only you needn't be scared of me. And as for the Indian, he's my friend. And he won't hurt you. He's promised me. Now, I'd like you and your horse to go back into the big crate. I'll stick the knot back in the wood. You'll feel safer. Then I'll get you some breakfast. Boone brightened visibly at that mention. What would you like? Oh, shucks. I ain't that hungry. Couple bits of steak and three or four eggs sitting on small heaps of beans and washed down with the jug of coffee will suit me just dandy. Coffee? I think he means coffee. <laughs> You'll be lucky, thought Omri. And our next chapter, chapter 10, is called A Breakfast Truce. <laughs>